are, what fans are actually running. A um, little stuffy today, so uh, um, we make these transitions. Um, as we gather for worship and fellowship and time together on this Lord's Day, let's begin with a word of prayer. We come before you, O God, as those who dream of a better day. We seek your reign, O God, where mouths are filled with laughter and tongues with shouts of joy. Yet we are a people who also mourn and grieve. We bring that sadness before you, O God. We pray that those who sow tears will reap joy. We pray that those who come together today are aware of your presence and filled with your spirit. Guide and receive our worship this day. Fill us with your praise that we may go out with shouts of joy and hearts full of thanksgiving. For we come in the name and by the grace of our Lord Jesus the Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Differences, 
that make this world so blessed. We joyously welcome all people to God's table, service, and fellowship. Please stand if you are able and join me in the call to worship. Thus says the Lord, I am about to do a new thing. Do you not perceive it? The Lord will make a way in the wilderness. And rivers in the desert. Even the wild animals will honor the Lord. For the Lord gives water in the desert to give drink to God's chosen people. The people who God formed and protects. The people who are made to declare praise to the Lord. Praise, praise the Lord. Let's join joyfully in our uh, hymn, Lead On, O Cloud of Presence, which is found on 633 in your hymnal or behind me on the screen. This card intrigues me. I'm going to read it verbatim. 
Prayers for a safe trip down and up the Grand Canyon for Dan, his brother Rick, mm -hmm. and our children. Notice Karen is missing from that <laughs> list. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> um, uh, uh, from Evelyn, we hear that Nicole is still going strong and uh, asks for us to keep the prayers going for her full recovery. Um, uh, Nicole, uh, Evelyn's uh, stepson's brother Stevie is making progress, but it's very, very slow. We began praying for him in the last couple of weeks. Um, uh, Evelyn's main concern is that he won't have a lot of pain, and um, also for um, her grandson David's foot. Um, um, he's currently in a boot, and they're hoping it won't require surgery for an injury that took place there. So we offer our prayers uh, with David. Um, Martha, remember, asked us last week to pray for her friend Nancy, who was to have heart surgery. Well, she's going home tomorrow, and we give thanks to God for that. That's good news. Um, um, this looks like Nancy's right. Yeah, prayers for Denise. Um, five radiation down, nine more to go. Not, not halfway, but um, a third of the way. That's good. And uh, prayers for the family of um, Brittany Sim, a young woman who died suddenly this week. And we lift up our prayers for those who knew and loved Brittany. I know there are others that go unwritten and mentioned, and so let's take a moment of silent prayer to lift up these and others which are on our hearts and minds. Will you join me in the spirit of prayer? O oh God of grace and love, as we continue our journey toward Jerusalem, as we continue the quest of Lent, we come before you yet again with prayers, with joys, with petitions, with concerns, and with grief and pain. God of mercy, we ask your blessing upon us. Join us on this journey as we seek to know, remember, and feel assured in your journey of death and resurrection. We see the signs of new life perking up, the grass begins to turn green, the trees are budding, the flowers are starting to show leaves and sometimes even blooms. As the birds fly about and chirp, we know that spring is technically here and continuing to come all at once. God of grace, we give you thanks for the reminders of new and renewed life that come each spring. We hold fast to those reminders of your eternal goodness and blessing and give you thanks for the other reminders we've experienced. We give you thanks for the uh, baby dedication for, for, for Ethan. We give you thanks for continued progress for... Uh, Nicole for signs of healing with Stevie um, and we give you thanks for the journey and the progress that Denise has experienced as well as Nancy's um, strong recovery and we give thanks and we hold fast to those blessings as signs that you hear our prayers you respond and we lift them up yet again God of mercy and grace, we lift up prayers for Joshua as he seeks a diagnosis. Grant wisdom and um, creativity to the physicians that are seeking an understanding of what is uh, challenging him. We offer our prayers of safety and concern, not only for Martin and Sue as they travel, but for um, Dan and Rick and all of the children as they make a journey of a different sort and ask your blessing of care. We lift up our prayers for David and pray for healing in his foot. And we lift up our prayers for those that are struggling with cancer and disease and illness. God of grace, we confess we find confusion in the loss of life for those that are young. 
And we ask your blessing on all of those who are affected, who loved and cared for Brittany. And ask your blessing on her family and her friends as they go through this time of trauma and difficulty. God of grace, we do lift up the ministries of this church, of the First Christian Church of Downers Grove, and ask your blessing and guidance on our work. And we join in lifting up prayers of solidarity and support for our sister congregations in Springfield and Sterling and Sullivan, and ask your blessings on those churches, their leadership, their ministers, and their ministries. God of love, as we can see the light of Easter drawing near, as we draw close to the beginning of Holy Week, just a week away, oh God, tune our hearts to your song. Guide us on our journey and help us to see your presence. Touch our lives and remind us of the joys and the sorrows of the time that is ahead. Help us to find meaning in our own lives in the midst of the reminder and rehearsing of these stories. God of grace, we lay before you our love, our devotion, our hope, and our dreams. Bless each one, receive our requests, and help us where you may. For we offer our prayers in the name and by the grace of your Son, Jesus the Christ. And we pray. <clears throat> Amen. Our scripture reading is from John chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. And it was six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of, pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. <coughs> the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. God bless the man of your understanding.
It's okay to say no. Yes. Do you know what extravagant means? Up and down for yes, side to side for no. Snore if you were asleep already. Okay. Tell me something in your life that would be extravagant. Super expensive. Would never dream of buying it for yourself. But would love to have it. Crazy expensive. I can't believe it. It's okay, Alice. There's a reason for this, and we're going to get to it. <laughs> um, well, don't like adults want real peace and stuff? Well, world peace isn't really something you can buy. It's so expensive, though. It's, uh, it would be colossally expensive, I would think. Come on, be extravagant. Shoes, clothes, gaming systems. What? A Picasso. Oh, I liked Picasso better, but I'll go with the castle. A castle would be extravagant. Now we're dreaming. I like it. You can, you can have a state, but it has to be South Dakota. <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> exactly. Anybody? Any any others? Do you got anything extravagant? I, you know, I was going to say a llama, but I'll go with a lot of pandas. That's good. A lot of pandas would be extravagant. It would be something that everybody else would go, why did you waste your money on that? Why would you waste your money on that? Because I love those things. It makes me happy. It gives me joy to spend it that way, right? Well, the story we have in the Bible is about a woman that does something extravagant for Jesus. Spends what would be the equivalent of a working person's year, a year of their wages. And basically pours it on his feet. 
that I, I want you to understand, because when we talk about 300 denarii, it's like, what does that mean? Well, it's pretty darn extravagant for the story. It's a big deal that that value was spent in that way. And so understandably, some people, one in this story gets a little judgmental about that. I mean, if you bought a castle and put it right in the middle of your neighborhood, other people might think that was a little silly, wouldn't they? Because it didn't match all the houses around it and stuff. Or if you had a, what is a group of pandas called? Do anyone know? A group of pandas. A group of pandas. For this sake, it's a group of pandas. Um, if you had a group of pandas in your backyard and put up the bamboo forest that went with it to feed said pandas, right? Because isn't that what they eat, I think? Yes? Yes, okay. When in doubt, look at mom. They always know. They always know what to feed the animal. It's amazing. People would think that was a little weird, wouldn't they? They're like, this is odd if we're right here. They'd be jealous. Or if you put a whole state in your backyard, you know, you'd have Rhode Island. Um, <laughs> see what I did there? Small state. You like that? Uh, I, I was kind of proud of it because I just made that one up on the fly. Um, thanks, Bob. Um, <laughs> was that Bob? I figured as much. <laughs> so, this Bible story is not necessarily about somebody doing the exact calculations, but it's about saying, why would you do that? We're doing something bigger here. Because if you all did those things, do you think I might quietly say, mm, we're going to spend any on that, or maybe, I don't know, a gift to God? Um, you think I might say that to you? Wow, I'm going to translate you just a little bit, if that's okay. And if you hate what I translate you with, that's fine. Because um, God doesn't necessarily want nice things as much as what God wants your heart. Yeah, basically, that's what I said. Yeah. just Okay, I've got to repeat that for those that couldn't hear you. Because he said basically what I just said, only with better grammar. <laughs> Oh, it's a funny day. Um, so that's exactly where I was going. You know, regardless of what people do, if they do things that seem extravagant, if they make choices, God is happiest with your heart and the giving of your heart and the willingness to then be kind to other people and loving and caring and faithful and generous. So um, we don't judge other people. We focus on loving other people, especially our siblings. <laughs> We focus on trying to love them and understand them and care for them. It, it, it takes some time, but by the time you're adults, it's going to be amazing. It's, it's stunning, actually. Okay, enough of that. Let's say our prayer before I get too far off the road. Dear God, thank you for your extravagant love for me. Help me to return that love. Every day. Every day. Amen. Amen. You're staying with me. Yeah, yeah you're preaching. Didn't you know? They didn't tell you? Okay, you can sit back there. You know that never works? I don't know what's going to happen someday when I look at someone and say, you're preaching. They go, okay. I'm really like, all right, I'll sit down. <laughs> Fine by me. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we do give you thanks for the gift of your word and for our desire to interpret your word. Be with us and help us, guide us and protect us, O Lord, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together will be acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So today we have the retelling of a colossally familiar story that is at the same time not all that familiar at all. Right? Because what we have is a differing version of the anointing, if you will, of Jesus' feet. Right? There's some subtle differences that took place in the, ver in the version my brain, my tongue wouldn't work. 
that we read today versus what we find in other gospel accounts. Most notably, the woman is specifically named and is specifically Mary and is specifically, from the context of the story, the Mary of Mary and Martha. <coughs> right? In their home. In Lazarus' home. So this is different from the unnamed, might have been woman of ill repute. And the problem is, over the years, we've had people reconstructing, reinterpreting, re-understanding. Before you know it, the stories are blended. It might be Mary Magdalene instead of the regular Mary. But even then, she doesn't deserve the reputation. And we have all this confusion over who's doing what, who is this really, and what does it matter? And I jokingly and honestly meant to change it and forgot, <laughs> called this under working title the stewardship chair. Because I had this imagination early on of the stewardship chair of a church somewhere seeing something extravagantly done for Jesus and saying, that really should have gone to the general budget. <laughs> and I really meant to come up with a different title, and honestly, I forgot. So to, to all you current, former, et cetera, stewardship chairs out there, I apologize. I just forgot it was there until, until the bulletin was printed, and I went, oops. <laughs> Meanwhile, back at the story, though, we do have several fascinating things that we have to unpack. I want to start not so much with Mary, but I want to start with Judas for a minute. Because Judas gets not one, but two harsh parenthetical comments. Right? In the story, we hear not only Judas, parentheses, the one that was going to betray him, or about to be preparing to betray him, depending on the translation you read. And then later, he said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he kept the common purse and stole from it. He was a thief. Now, I know this is hard, because you know the end story. But I want to pause for a moment and remember, A, we're in the Gospel of John. And this is important, especially if you've been around on some of the Wednesdays, because you know that one of the things that John does in his gospel is gives us a construct that really looks at these key characters a little differently and gives a little bit of grace and movement in the midst of them. And so for John to have these parenthetical comments, these, these asides about Judas, tells us something. It tells us that John is trying to construct a story that vilifies Judas. Now, that's a problem. That's a challenge. Because later in John, Jesus is going to basically declare Judas as necessary and part of God's divine plan. Jesus does the same thing with the people who condemn him. Basically, you just... Just roll with this. I mean, Pilate is trying hard to let Jesus off in John, and Jesus basically says, just roll with this. This is how it has to go. I mean, I realize that's a very modern translation of what Jesus said. But Jesus is saying, you know, you, you can't see this. I, I, I know the whole story. And so this set of parenthetical comments that we get from John about Judas really should cause us, once we've read the whole Gospel of John, to go, now wait a minute. Is he evil? Or is he chosen to do something that we might interpret as evil? Because now we've got a tough juxtaposition on our hands. Maybe it's just me. <laughs> and Judas ultimately is excused by Jesus, but vilified by the author of John. And that's our clue. I don't know about all of you and all of your lives. I know way too much about all of me and all of my life. And I have had moments in my life 
where I or the writer of the story or the teller of the story about me might want to vilify me a little extra because there was pain or hurt or disappointment that they didn't see coming that happened. And Jesus writes the story with grace. Let that sink in for a second. We all have had life experiences where we have disappointed someone that would tell the story about us in ways we wouldn't feel good about. It, it happens. It's part of life. We all have people in our life that we've disappointed, we've upset, that we didn't act in the way they wanted to. And somewhere out there, they may still be telling the story about us that we don't want to know is being told, right? And Jesus is taking those parenthetical comments and, say, and meeting them with grace. The same thing happens to Mary in this story. If you think about it, Judas immediately vilifies her choice, right? And Jesus immediately meets it with grace. You see, this is a story about people judgment versus God judgment. Take your head out of the role of the stewardship chair completely for a minute. Quit worrying about the money. The money is a little bit of a straw dog to confuse you. And focus on the way that Jesus accepts people. Even the Judas piece of it in the whole of the Gospel. See, the story suddenly tells a very different story of grace, of hope, of possibility that Jesus even excuses the one that another says is evil and a liar and a robber and a thief and whatever else doesn't care about the poor <coughs> description. It should come as no great surprise to you that I would stand up in front of you and reinterpret a story you thought you knew as a story of grace, right? At this point, you ought to know that that's one of the things I'm pretty darn guilty of, pretty darn regularly. That's because I believe in it. That's because I believe that everyone here deserves to be reminded again and again and again that God loves you enough to see you in a way that only God and possibly your mother could see you. That's because there are people driving by right now that need to meet God that we're talking about, <coughs> possibly in a way that isn't the same as the way we are meeting God. So, look out, up your seatbelts, here it comes. I think the other thing this story is about is the willingness to say to church, this extravagance, this thing that you think is stupid and silly, it doesn't meet your needs at all, whatever it is, some crazy new ministry, some crazy thing, some rearranging of the tables, or God forbid, um, changing where the chancel furniture is set. It's not for you. Your mission when you said yes to becoming a part of the church was to make a place that reached as many people as possible for the grace of Jesus Christ. And it looks to me like doing things exactly the same way at the same time in the same place is great for all y'all and it's important because y'all need to be fed too. But maybe that's not the only thing we need to be doing. Maybe there's an extravagance out there we have that God hasn't put on our hearts yet. But we need to be willing to say, if it changes a life, if it transforms somebody, if it allows somebody an entryway into the door, then let's do it. Last week we had our 
first of 2019 back to school fair meeting. And you know what we talked about? I'm going to let the cat out of the bag. We talked about rearranging how we do things. <gasps> and the foundation stayed solid and the roof stayed above our head and there was no lightning idea that I recall. <laughs> Certainly we weren't struck by it. And I was so blessed by the conversation because I watched everyone in the room start thinking about how this helped make things easier for our guests, the people we were serving. And I went, yes. Even though we had a couple of moments of, well, that's really going to confuse some of our people. Right? We, no, where's Dan? <laughs> we had those moments of, oh, that could be really confusing for our people. That means we're going to have to walk around and try to figure out routing. That means we're going to have to walk around and figure out, is this craziness work? That means we've got to do a couple of things earlier, right? Um, Sue's not here to, to attest to it, but Martha is. That means we've got to make a list earlier than we were going to because we've got another crazy idea. And it's all because we... We're sitting in a room where we prayed for God to help us stay aware of and care deeply for those who would come to our grounds and seek to be served by our church. And God said, okay. So, you know what? Sometimes, well, I'll say it this way. I was in a meeting in um, 1997. I know, that was ages ago. Wow. Dick Ham was the relatively new general minister and president of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. I don't know if you're familiar with that office, general minister and president, but uh, I'll be happy to explain that for you at another time. And, and, and Dick was in a, in a meeting, and it was during the era where there was a lot of controversy around contemporary versus traditional music in worship. And um, somebody raised their hand in that gathering and said, what's your opinion, what's your position on these worship wars? That was the term that was used. And, and this conflict over this, this, this crazy extravagant newness and how much we're spending on, on all these things, on screens and instrumentation and sometimes musicians and all these crazy things. <clears throat> and that was, that was convenient timing, but I don't know if it had a purpose, but maybe it did. Um, and Dick said, I wrote it down because I thought it was so profound. I, he made it look like it was right off the top of his head. I'm pretty sure he had thought of this answer in advance because it was that profound. He said, I believe it is the responsibility of those who have possessed the gospel the longest to be the most flexible with it for the sake of the gospel. I know, that was a lot of words. I'm going to repeat it. I believe it is the responsibility of those who have possessed the gospel the longest to be the most flexible with it for the sake of the gospel. Now, before you get too tense about that, this is before we really had open and affirming churches, people. So already I can look out at you and say, this church which has possessed the gospel a long time has been flexible with the interpretation of it for the sake of the gospel in a really profound and meaningful way. And what I'm saying to you today is these extravagances of anything we might be dreaming of that God might put on our hearts, that might, God might call us in order to reach people for the sake of the gospel, we may have a responsibility to say, hmm, instead of getting parenthetical comments about my judginess, I should get parenthetical comments about the graciousness just like Jesus has done for you. The gospel of Jesus Christ is too big to be stuffed into one box and pattern. The gospel of Jesus Christ is too gracious to be worried about other people's interpretations of each of us. The gospel of Jesus Christ is too important to be left to chance. We are called to be a people of action, a people willing to take chances for the sake of the gospel, even if it makes the stewardship chair nervous because we should have put it in the general fund.
<coughs> may God challenge us to be a church infectious with the spread of the gospel for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Yes, I'm taking all. Okay, so we have a song of invitation where normally I would give you a speech about joining the church, but it's kind of pointless today. So instead, um, perhaps let this song challenge you as um, uh, to dream big about ways for the gospel to be spread in this place. Will you stand as you're able and sing the song of invitation number 86 from Chalice Praise, Change My Heart.
God, we come to your table in praise and thanksgiving for your gift of grace through your Son, Jesus Christ. Yet as we come, we admit that we can be drawn away, seeking security in earthly possessions and desires that weigh us down, making it difficult to respond to your call. As we eat this bread, fill us with your spirit and bring us back to your service as your beacons of light spreading your love throughout this world. We pray in the name of the one who came as a servant to all, Jesus Christ. God of all, may the power of your spirit become an enabling power in our lives. As we take this cup of the Lord's table, now we remember your son Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed and ask that in what we think and do might not betray him in our own lives. Fill us now with your spirit, O oh God, that we become more worthy instruments of your love and peace in our daily lives. And now let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We come remembering that Jesus was gathered with his disciples when he took bread. And when he had given thanks for it, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks for it, he said, Drink of it, all of you, for this cup is a new covenant in my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sin. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord until He comes.
So if you look in your bulletin and see what's going on this week, you should be confused. But let me explain. Um, and if this repair will happen, it will happen in the sanctuary, it will happen by phone. The board meeting, which is scheduled for Tuesday, uh, we looked at uh, business items to be dealt with, and seeing none, there's not a real compelling reason to be face-to-face, -face, so Joy has canceled that meeting. Um, we will be um, uh, compiling the reports that were sent and sending those out for review and email discussion if necessary. Um, but any business actions will wait until the May meeting. Um, Wednesday, Feed the Body and Soul is definitely happening. And, you know, not trying to promote too much, but uh, I'm signed up to Feed the Body. And I have this uh, relatively new smoker and a brisket calling my name. So I'm just saying, you might want to make it to church on Wednesday. Um, and, I, and I did that in my Texas accent for a reason. Um, and then, of course, we will gather next Sunday, not for just any ordinary Sunday, but for Palm Sunday, um, a celebration of remembering the triumphant entry, your triumphal entry into Jerusalem uh, by Jesus. And so I encourage you to make that the first priority as you begin the journey of Holy Week um, with, your, with your church community. Um, Basket stuff continues to be gathered. There's two sign-up sheets on the table. There is a sign-up sheet for Easter brunch, breakfast, whatever, um, whichever B word it is, and also one for Monday Thursday to bring soup or bread or wine. Yes, we get that wine. Um, and what else am I missing, Karen? Oh, I just wanted to let everyone know that the number for MIP has changed. Um, it's correct now on the website, and there's papers out there so um, particularly those joining in pick up a paper because it's a new, new phone number is it correct in here um if she got my email <laughs> good because i wouldn't know for sure the difference so why don't you take a look at that you can let me know um that's not the correct number on the inside of the bulletin yeah, so right. don't use your bulletin insert yes so the chicago herpetological society the folks that are going to be at the, the back to school fair yeah. They are having their, their large fundraiser. I think there's some flyers out here next week, next weekend. So oh, see, I didn't think it was the same group. Apparently, it's the same, same group, group, Alice. Same group. So okay, that's a big you're, fundraiser you're next so weekend. So inclined to go visit, they would welcome welcome all the support. We know the Herpetological Society is a very uh, big crowd pleaser for back yes. to school fair, so we want to do what we can. Yes, Alice. I have three tea tickets left. Oh wow. <laughs> wow. Um, also, Louisa May Alcott, known as Leslie Goddard, will be joining us at the tea after her presentation. She told me she looks forward to that every year. So, if you don't have your tea tickets, now's the time. My goodness! Now. I want everybody to turn around and look at the clock, because you know, when I started announcements, we were on time. <laughs> it's not my fault. I may have had a miscommunication with Carol, but you can still um, reserve your Easter flowers, order an Easter lily. So see me if you would still like to do that. You can also still make a gift to the uh, Belarus Fund, um, as was on the slides before worship. Uh, that ministry knows no ending date, so certainly our willingness to receive gifts it knows no ending as well. Um, I think that's it. No. 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 Alan. I, I have an announcement uh, for the people in the Downers Grove Township. They may want to go to a meeting. It's at the township offices. It's, I believe, the tenth. Um, they have plans to build a new facility on that vacant lot and it may impact your taxes oh uh, okay i unfortunately i can't go because i'm not part of the Downers Road township but there is like a go, but there is a significant development going on they want okay. to, they want to build a, a facility in we would go from about 5,000 square feet down to 2,000. We meaning fish? Fish. fish? So this could directly affect fish and how much space it has available. Yes. 
There we go. Um, no, so I urge people to go. Excellent. Thank you for that information. Um, seeing no others, uh, let us uh, wrap up our time of worship with our song of praise from 190 and Chalice Praise, Peace to You. <laughs>